This is Blake Ditkus. Hi there. In a lot of ways, he's just your typical 10-year-old boy. A lover of sports, video games, and making his family laugh. Who are you looking at? Hey, I'm looking at the birthday boy. <laughs> this is Blake's stepmom, China. Thanks, China, for decorating the place for Blake's birthday. Okay, Sean, thank you for hosting me. At 26, she is a natural beauty, inside and out. A career-driven woman and a missionary for her church. He the video camera. <laughs> Blake and China both shared an uncanny ability to light up any room with their smiles. And yet, someone murdered them both in cold blood. It was a hot Monday in July. No one in the town of Franklin, Indiana would ever forget. Blake Ditkus had just finished spending the weekend with his dad and China and was preparing to go back to his mom's. We planned to go to the movies when I got off work. And he was really excited at the time. He's like, oh, can we uh, stop and get some candy too? And I'm like, yes. It was a promise she could not keep. I would say maybe about 30 minutes later, uh, China called me back and she asked me, she goes, would you mind if I keep Blake longer so that he could have lunch with his dad because China was supposed to take Blake over to my mom's. I said, sure, that's not a problem. Simple words that now haunt her. I wish I would have said no, <laughs> but, you know, I don't think anything would be wrong with, you know, him having lunch with his dad. The timeline of what happened next is now a part of official police record. Sean Dickus, husband of China Dickus, the father of Blake Dickus, he was home that day. He had lunch with them, and that was at approximately 12:45, I believe. He left at about 1:45, went back to work. Soon after that, Christina receives a call from her mother. My mom called me at work, and she was like, "You know, Christina, I told China I would meet her. You know, after I got done running some errands, and she's not answering." And I'm like, "Call Sean," and I never heard back from my mom. After work. Movie tickets in hand, Christina arrives at her parents' house. And my mom was like, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm here to get Blake. And she's like, Christina, I called and I told you I couldn't, I couldn't get a hold of him. And then I become mad. Feeling annoyed, Christina drives to her ex-husband's home, expecting to find an apologetic China, or maybe a lame excuse. Anything but what she actually found. I could hardly even pull down their street. There was like cop car after police car. And I was like, you know, what is going on? I'm trying to focus and I look down and I see yellow caution tape all around. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's their house. And there was a coroner's van. The garage door was up. And I just went running down the sidewalk yelling Blake's name. At the house, she's met by the last person any mother wants to see, a homicide detective. He stopped me at the end of the driveway and he's, he started, you know, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Blake's mom. Where's my son? Where, where is he at? What hospital? Just tell me right now. And he just couldn't even look at me. And I go, don't tell me that. I go, just where's my baby? And he just shook his head, and, and I, I just fell. Sadly, inside the home, detectives find China Ditkus dead of multiple stab wounds. Not far away, young Blake has also been stabbed, beaten, and smothered. Blake Ditkus, in addition, received blunt force trauma and as, uh, asphyxiation as a cause of death. He had to be begging for his life, you know, and I wonder, was he asking for me? You know, I mean, what my child went through. <sighs> Cops wondered who could have perpetrated such a heinous and brutal attack. Suspicion immediately turned to the last person who saw China and Blake alive and the first person to find them dead, Sean Dickus. He arrived home from work that day at approximately 14 minutes after 5, discovered their bodies in the home. There was no sign of forced entry to the home whatsoever. We took him down to the station where we could talk to him for a little bit. But after extensive questioning 
and even a polygraph test. Sean is officially cleared as the possible killer. Sean cooperated with everything we asked him to do. He was at work, he was alibied, and he's just not a person of interest in the homicides. I didn't fault anybody for that. I'm the one that found him, so, you know, fingers pointed at me, and I can understand that. Kind of made me withdraw into a shell a little bit, uh, and it was very difficult. You loved your family. I did. And I do. Um, what happened that day when you went home? I went home for lunch that day, and uh, Blake was getting excited about going home because he was going to go to the movies with his mom. And you know, I just saw I can remember is rubbing the back of his head and giving him a kiss, and and you know, tell him goodbye. I left uh, the garage and, and pulled out, and Chyna was at the mailbox, and I gave her you know a kiss and said goodbye to her, and that's that's the last thing I remember. Until he says he pulled into his garage that night, a moment he still has trouble talking about, and rightfully so. I came home to, to the horror. What did you see? Well, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. It was the worst thing imaginable, I can tell you that. I'm quite sure no one who knows and loves Blake and China ever thought they'd see them like this. Their faces plastered on a billboard after they'd both been murdered. But this is a reminder of what happened that day. But it's also a very bold and desperate plea for someone out there to do the right thing and help the cops catch their killer. I don't know how somebody could do this and continue living with themselves. Why can't they come forward? Please. Our family needs justice. For now, there are still no official suspects in the killings. But Crime Watch Daily is not about to let Blake's and China's murders be forgotten and neither are police. We can tell you exactly who hasn't committed this crime. What we want to be able to tell you is who did. It seemed too random, so tragic. 10-year-old Blake Dickus and his young stepmother, China, murdered in their own home. China was everything for me. She made me who I was. I, w I was a great man. And uh, she definitely, uh, she was the one behind me. Now, nearly 500 leads later, police still have no suspects, no motives, no closure. It just can't go unsolved. They were just brutally, brutally killed for no reason. Adding to the tragedy, Sean and China had moved into the house just one month before. It was a really nice house, and I thought it was a nice neighborhood. I was happy for them. Police scour the home for evidence and find a confusing scene. No obvious sign of forced entry and few clues. Eerily, all signs point to a random crime, unlike anything this peaceful community had ever seen. Though as officers soon learn, the neighborhood wasn't completely without its troubles. There was a series of home invasion burglaries around the same time of the murders. They were all within a half mile radius of the homicide scene. I wasn't aware that, you know, until later on after the fact that there was burglaries going on around the subdivision or anything of that nature. Um, it was all after the fact that I found out those things. Could those crimes be connected to the murders? Police reach out to the community for help solving the burglaries. But those cases also remain unsolved. We have done uh, probably over 400 leads on this investigation. We have interviewed literally hundreds, if not thousands of people. Can you talk about the gentleman in Florida? We had a lead on this investigation that came out of Florida uh, near the Tampa area. Uh, an individual had contacted us from Indiana who was in prison there and wanted to confess to the homicides. Uh, because we've been very protectful of our scenes and the information and our evidence, uh, we were able to quickly rule out that he was not a suspect in this investigation. How does that feel when it's dashed like that? Yeah, it's, it's a big letdown, especially when it's something that was uh, a complete and utter fabrication. But authorities here in Franklin, Indiana, are quick to say this is anything but a cold case. I don't know of any case we've ever worked nine years on nonstop. This case still has five investigators working on it. We continue to work every day on it, and we won't stop until it's done. In fact, just this year, 
thanks to a tip from Blake's mother, Christina. Investigators received a unique opportunity they hope will break this case wide open. The family had mentioned to us to wanting to know if we had ever reached out to the VDOC Society in Philadelphia. Quite frankly, I'd never heard of the VDOC Society. You know, I've been a detective 25 years. But uh, when she reached out, I thought, I didn't know anything about it. But we'll sure look into it. And we did. What they discovered was an exclusive group of crime fighters made up of forensic experts, former and current FBI profilers, detectives, scientists, psychologists, and more. The Elite Club, which only meets 12 times a year, was created for the sole purpose of solving difficult cold case homicides. We contacted the BDOC Society and uh, were offered an opportunity of June of this year to come out and speak to them and present our case. In particular, society members questioned Sergeant Borges about the series of home invasions that all happened within a half mile radius of the murder scene. One of those burglaries occurred the same day as the homicides on the same street. We had been very protective of that information. One of the uh, former agents from the Bureau had mentioned to us what has it got you up to this point? He says, time to get it out. Now, Franklin police are releasing new details to Crime Watch Daily about the series of burglaries, five in total, all in the months of June and July, 2006 and 2007. There were many of these burglaries where there was a T-cut pattern in the screen that was the entry point that the person gained entry to the residence to go inside. They were all residential burglaries. They all occurred Monday through Friday during the daytime hours. We noticed that some of the homes almost shared the exact same characteristics of minor ransacking. And typically, it would be things that were of insignificant value to what you might be associated with a professional burglar taken out of the residence. Uh, coins, food, drink. Police won't say whether the precise same conditions of the burglaries were found in the home of the murders but they believe there's enough of a connection to release these details and hopefully jog the community's memory. We could very well solve the murder if we can solve these burglaries. But the truth is, until that day comes, suspicion will continue to hang over the town of Franklin. We didn't have any, anyone that didn't like us. And we were always happy and we did nothing but enjoy serving others and I don't understand. Lives never lived, hopes and dreams never realized. These are just a few of the things the killer took, leaving behind only memories. This is, uh, to be honest with you, it's the first time I've, I've looked at video of Blake in probably almost nine years. So it's, uh, Blake would be 19. Wow. If, yeah. He would be turning 20 in February. Picture that for me. I have a hard time picturing that. I mean, it's like my life, it, it's, it froze, you know, nine years ago when I lost him. I just wonder, I'm like, how tall would he be? You know, what would he be like? What would he want to be doing? I would love to see what he would look like today.